less liked than the IRS, quarrelsome and ineffective. The U.S. Congress is hardly good for America's business. Putting it back in business is the priority for one woman who's been there. She'll share her ideas next on Global Perspectives. This is Global Perspectives with Pulitzer Prize winning commentator John Bercia. Welcome to Global Perspectives. Many Americans nostalgically remember when Congress was functional. Is it possible to get it working properly again? Ugly partisanship and threatened shutdowns have become the norm in Washington. The Founding Fathers clearly intended for there to be debate, but gridlock? Actually, it wasn't so long ago that the nation's lawmakers frequently reached for consensus on foreign policy and even many domestic issues. Olympia Snow, a former U.S. Senator from Maine, who served 34 years in Congress, remembers those days. In her book, Fighting for Common Ground, How We Can Fix the Stalemate in Congress, she explains why getting past the current divide is critical to addressing the challenges facing America. She will tell us her approach to holding government accountable and restoring the Congress we once knew. <laughs> Welcome to the show, Senator Snow. Thank you, it's great to be here, John. Tell us about the biggest, most significant moment you had during your 34 years in Congress. Well, there are obviously a number of them given that span of time, but I think um, the most, uh, you know, most significant is any time in which you're you know, making a decision uh, to go to war. And I well recall, uh, for example, uh, in 1991, uh, when uh, President Bush um, had to make a decision uh, regarding uh, Iraq's invasion of Kuwait and to repel that invasion and building a coalition to do so. And he invited a, a group of members of the House of Representatives uh, to the White House on a bipartisan basis the day before we were to consider that resolution to grant him the authorization uh, to go to war. And as we were sitting um, you know, in the cabinet room, he was at one point um, you know, uh, left the room uh, to go back into the Oval Office to take a call from then Secretary of State James Baker um, who was then in discussions with uh, Saddam Hussein's foreign minister, Tariq Aziz, about the possibilities of, you know, alternatives and, and a peaceful resolution uh, to the crisis. Uh, but that wasn't to be based on the look on President Bush's face when he reemerged into the cabinet room and we realized we had a decision uh, to make uh, in going forward with that resolution to grant him the authority to do so. And obviously, you know, we made that decision and, he went, and we went to war. And it was successful, obviously, and fortunately. But it's an example of how one, you know, when you have to make the most momentous decision, you know, and putting men and women in harm's way. Secondly, uh, building an effective coalition. But third, in the way in which President Bush, uh, you know, worked with Congress on a bipartisan basis on, on these critical issues and, and underscores what is missing today. Mm -hmm. It almost sounds like a different world. You're talking about bipartisan yeah. discussions and cooperation between the, the president and, and the Congress and so forth. Mm -hmm. And today it's a very, very frustrating environment, uh, so much so that you declined to run again for, for the Senate. Uh, help us understand that decision mm -hmm. and, and then we'll talk a little bit about what you're doing now. Well, John, you know, it, was, it wasn't an easy decision. It wasn't one that I had, you know, been pondering for a long time. Otherwise, I wouldn't have worked to build my organization to run for re-election organizationally and financially. Uh, but as I started to think about the future, you know, in the Senate, and I was getting closer to submitting my de uh, signatures from, and the deadline was getting closer, and it became more clarifying. And I started to contemplate, you know, how, you know, it would be in the Senate under the current circumstances of the polarization and realized, you know, that it wasn't going to change. I mean, it was that sudden realization, almost, you know, to the point of waking up one night thinking through how it would work, and I realized it wasn't going to change. And it wasn't who I was. Um, I, you know, I didn't want to go home all the time explaining why we weren't doing anything, why, you know, there's, you know, the lockdown on both sides. And so I realized that, you know, at this stage of my life, uh, that perhaps I could contribute in another way. I loved public service. I loved what it was all about and the power of being able to do good. And uh, that wasn't uh, what it was about anymore. It was more all, ab all about the politics. So I had to come to that conclusion very quickly, I might add. 
I wasn't so it wasn't easy under either circumstance. Mainly the decision and the time in which, you know, I really inflicted on myself to make that decision when I came to terms with this realization. And I decided that I could fight outside the institution to, you know, give force and, and voice to the people who feel like I do about it and what we can do to change it. I want people to know they can change it. I mean, it's not, you know, I'm a can do person. This is a can do country. So I want to make people understand. As someone who's been there for 34 years, there was another way and many examples of how it works. It's not to say it was all pleasant and easy, it wasn't, but rather it was, I think, uh, the understanding that in the final analysis you could get a solution to a particular problem, that you could get there from here, as they used to say, uh, in Maine. Well, uh, w what's your explanation for what went wrong, just in a nutshell? Well, it's just hard to know where it all started, but obviously it's an evolution. I mean, there's obviously on the Republican side, it's the political realignment that's occurring within the party itself, and um, you know, more concentrated in, in the South and um, Southwest, um, and certainly um, that had changed the party, I think, dramatically over time. And then, of course, I think the outside groups, the third party groups that you know, fuel and demonize, uh, you know, the opposition on both sides. They spend millions of dollars, and that has grown exponentially uh, in the course of the campaigns over the years, and that has spilled over in the legislative process. And so now, you know, candidates and, and incumbents oftentimes feel, you know, more aligned with those who are willing to support their campaigns in that fashion rather than to political parties or anything else. And so it's all about that base that nurtures and fosters that divide uh, that people are appealing to. So it's now become about the primary. So hence what you get in Congress are all issues tailored to a very narrow political base, an ideological base, and that is fostering it uh, in addition to what is happening in, in the media, both through the campaign uh, media and then also in the outside media and, you know, you know, fueling that divide. And one result is that Congress is not viewed very positively by many Americans, and you note in your book that it's held in even lower esteem than bankers, lawyers, and even the IRS. Uh, so <laughs> how do we bring it back to, to where it was? Well, it's a good question, because you would think that it would be, you know, a galvanizing moment, frankly, uh, for Congress to be embarrassed by the fact that they're held in such low esteem, and when I was there, that was the case. And in fact, um, at the end of uh, my year, I know I think a congressional approval was around 10 percent. And one of my former colleagues used to say, "Who exactly is that 10 percent that thinks that Congress is doing a good job?" Well, you know, you would have thought that would have motivated Congress, especially in the aftermath of the financial crisis. I mean, they tore apart the country. We're on the verge of an economic collapse. And we had to rebuild it. So you would have thought that would have been the moment that would have brought both sides together as a catalyst and engendered that, you know, unity. Not to say it would have been easy. Nothing, to, nothing ever is when it's, you know, much is at stake. But the fact is, it wasn't even a willingness to work across the aisle because somehow you'd be tarnished or tainted, you know, that you're compromising, therefore you're capitulating on your principles. Um, and so I b believe that there's another way, and, and it has been demonstrated in the past. And that is, we've got, as, as the public, have to exact accountability on the part of lawmakers, both in the elections, demanding to know whether or not they're willing to work across the political aisle to solve problems, you know, they're just not uh, being there for, you know, their ideological basis and political basis, but there for the greater good, you know, their constituencies in, in the country. And then secondly is making it known throughout the course of the year and uh, through media. And we should have independent redistricting commissions. That's one of the things that I'm working on with the Bipartisan Policy Center in Washington. We'll be coming out with a series of recommendations in, on June 24th, both on congressional electoral uh, reforms in addition to what we can do to encourage involvement in public service, especially among younger people, and hopefully that's the case here at uh, UCF. Uh, but we want to do, we want to change it, I want to change it, and we can. And we must change it now before it becomes a permanent way of governance uh, in, in Washington. Open primaries is another mm -hmm. example. Mitigating, I think, the ideological influences, uh, you know, in those primaries where it's, you know, concentrated among a few in terms of who influences the outcome. You used to get center-right, center-left candidates, and that's mm -hmm. no longer... Uh, been the case as much. 
And when, when you talk about this becoming a permanent feature, it's kind of frightening because how do you tend to the business of America, whether at home or abroad, when it's impossible to make decisions? And ultimately, doesn't it compromise our leadership capabilities here and internationally? Oh, absolutely. I mean, the rest of the world always looked to America for leadership and how it grappled with its own problems and how it made its decisions in confronting you know, the big issues, the big problems, and, and the small ones as well, which obviously, you know, we're, you know, Congress is lacking the capacity to do that as well. And so, you know, as a result, uh, it, it, people ask me the question, you know, consistently, what is going to become of America? You know, what about our country? What does it say about our country? What about, you know, future generations? What will be, you know, what will be for them? You know, if we don't grapple with the debt, if we don't change our task code to spur innovation, entrepreneurial, you know, development, which is so essential to this country, uh, and nurture the possibilities and maximum potential of the great country in which we live. Uh, but rather, that's being suppressed in Washington, uh, you know, in deference to the ideological bases and interests uh, that have nothing to do about solving the problems of, of our country. And so, yes, people do look to us to leadership, and it does have an impact. Uh, because they're saying, well, gosh, if we can't look to America, to whom do we look to in, in solving these great problems? And certainly that's the case in the United States Senate. I mean, you know, it's a deliberative body, and it's the highest deliberative body in the world, and it should rise to that occasion uh, to have those great debates, but also to have those great resolutions. Much of this discussion will turn on what the next generation does. How, how do you feel? So often it seems like the up and coming generation is sold kind of short. Uh, we don't have great expectations for them. And then when they rise to the occasion and tackle those challenges that we worried about, they do a pretty good job. Are you hopeful about the up and coming generation? And do you think they're ready for a change? Absolutely. I'm very optimistic about uh, current generations and future uh, for all the young people that I have met on college campuses, including here at the University of Central Florida. They're magnificent uh, because they care about the world around them. Uh, they're interested in contributing in some way uh, in the form of public service um, and want to know what's the best way to contribute. Um, and I always tell them that it's important, as I did in the question and answer period this morning when we had with honor students. Uh, the fact that it is important to be uh, to participate, especially for them, because they've got their lifetime ahead of them, and it's important to shape the country, and it's also a lifetime for the nation. You know, so often I've had this question from young people. They'll say, "Well, you know, you left, you know, public office, and now you're asking us to to uh, run for office." And I said, "Yes, because I'm at another point in my life where I think I can better contribute to make sure that this." this culture doesn't become uh, a permanent one. But for them, the stakes are greater in the sense that they've got their lifetime ahead of them. They've got to make sure that the country is in a position uh, you know, that can handle and address the questions that are going to be important to them and to their families. And the enormity of the debt is obviously one of those overarching issues uh, that matters profoundly for, for them and how we leave and what kind of country we leave to them. So yes, they've got to get engaged. But more importantly, is sharing, you know, uh, you know, with their neighbors in terms of talking and respecting differing ideas and working with one another. So I, I'm inspired by what I see uh, on campuses. Now, no doubt when you go out and speak about consensus building, some of the people who actually encourage the divide in Washington are probably in the audience from time to time. Do they try to engage in confrontational discussions? or? Do they keep quiet? Do they? What, what's your experience yeah. with them? Yeah, that's uh, you know. In some uh, cases, I've had questions more or less. You know, well, you know, bipartisanship isn't always good. Doesn't always produce great you know results. The, the point is, and uh, that you have to talk with one another to, to solve a problem. And I think that's the issue. Not to say that you know every result no is you know uh, the perfect one. No, you're not looking for perfect solutions. There never are. Uh, but the question is, you know that unless you have all the votes, <laughs> that you've got to make the process work. You've got to have the executive branch and the legislative branch working together. You have to have the president communi communicating with Congress and likewise with Congress and the president. 
They can't be operating as parallel universes. And so that is absolutely an imperative. Uh, so I tell people that there's no other way. You have to solve the problems. And you have to recognize what the other side wants. It may not work. So in some cases, it doesn't. But at least you're trying. People need to see a way forward that is possible in all these instances. It's like with the recent government shutdown. There was a shutdown in 95, and that wasn't good. But this, the difference between the two was the fact that people worried that the government would never reopen. Now, some people would say, well, that's great. Well, you know, it isn't great for America. That's, you know, it's a, it's a very negative, hostile viewpoint. Uh, government, you know, has to be made to work. You know, we have de debates about the role of government, it, you know, and the extent of it. Uh, but certainly, uh, it necessitates having your government working efficiently and effectively. President Reagan talked about an effective government. He didn't talk about eviscerating it. Mm -hmm. So I think that there is a big difference. And so that's what we have to return to. I'm trying to think of any sector or endeavor where consensus is not a central part of the conversation. Why should politics be different? That's a very good question. I've blended the same thing, how they apply this, you know, unrealistic standard of saying, well, you know, if you don't agree with me 100 percent, then it's not going to work. I don't know any realm of life where it was possible to achieve 100, get 100 percent of what you want. You have to work and you have to collaborate and you have to build consensus. That means talking to one another, knowing the facts, working through the issues, taking the time and the patience to do so, which is the way it used to be. Mm -hmm. but we had some very hefty debates, and they were fierce and they were ferocious. And, you know, you had your knockdown drag outs uh, on the floor or in the committees or, you know, when you're negotiating. But at the end of the day, you know you would achieve a result. The question was, what was it going to look like? And uh, in order to move the country forward, you know, President Bush 41, you know, he had to broker a very tough, you know, tax agreement as part of, you know, the budget in the midst of a recession. He paid a political price for that uh, back in 1991. But, you know, he did it because he, as he said, he had to move the country forward. And, uh, you know, so that's the point here. And I think that people have to be mindful of the, of the obligations they have in, a, in conjunction with holding public office. It's about, you know, solving problems of the people you represent in your state, in your country. Um, and that is so essential, especially at this moment in time. We've deferred on so many issues um, as a nation because Congress has been at a legislative and political standstill uh, for no good reason other than for the politics of it not for the be good interests and the best interests of America. Now, the problems in Washington didn't happen overnight. This developed over a period of years, mm -hmm. and I'm guessing the fix is probably going to take a period of years. Do you have any estimate as to how long this could take? Is it something we can fix in 10 years? Will it take a generation? Will it take longer than that? I hope not. Uh, I hope that we can fix it much sooner. I'm certainly an impatient person. But I think that America rightfully should be impatient. Americans should be. And they have it within their hands, really, about using the tools of technology. But in addition to that is launching initiatives for independent redistricting commissions in states so you can change the equilibrium in the House of Representatives, you know, launching initiatives for open primaries in states. And so you can get more, you know, more center-right, center-left candidates coming, merging from uh, these primaries, even for, for Senate races as well. Uh, so there are things that we can change that can make a, a profound difference. We ought to look at campaign finance reform once again. I've been involved in that issue, you know, in the past, and it was my provision was struck down Citizens United. Uh, but there are ways that we can speak up, and speaking up is important because the forces of division are really well organized, and they're well funded, and it fuels their interest to keep things divided and polarized. And we can change that because the majority of Americans believe that it should change. So I'm thinking we've got to lay the groundwork for reapportionment in 2020. And that's why having these initiatives on the ballot or through the legislature become paramount uh, so that we don't institutionalize uh, this current dysfunction. Um, and the same is true for open primaries. So we can lay the groundwork. And the bipartisan policy center will become a series of recommendations in June. And we also plan to build citizens for political reform to create a movement to change these and implement these reforms as well. The United States historically served as a model for emerging democracies, and mm -hmm. we've engaged in some nation-building activities in recent years. 
going forward, how much of a model will we be if we don't resolve this problem? Well, it's, you know, it's an important question. I mean, America is the greatest nation on earth, the greatest democracy. I mean, it has uh, been the beacon, you know, for so many countries, you know, uh, and fighting for, you know, an open society. And that will never change. I think the question is, is wondering, you know, and I think it's baffling many countries as to, you know, why Congress uh, and the President haven't been able to you know, reconcile their differences and that we've reached this point of dysfunction and political paralysis um, you know, for a country like America. I think that's what's so surprising to so many people. Um, and that's why we have to treat this you know, as an aberration and not allow it to become a trend. We don't want this to be the new normal because this isn't who we are. And you're right, we have to set, you know, I think, that path forward and how we as a democracy you know, bring, you know, have a responsibility uh, to the greater good of our nation so that all people can aspire to the maximum of their potential and the maximum potential of, of this fabulous nation um, in America. What has been the response to your book? I'm guessing you've had both supporters and critics. Well, actually, great support. You know, uh, I hear less from the critics, but maybe I'll hear them from now. <laughs> Uh, but um, people, you know, it tried to de those who denigrate compromise and consensus aren't living in the real world to begin with, in my view. And uh, you know, the all or nothing propositions, uh, you know, just a really a, um, an unfortunate, negative, counterproductive approach uh, to the problems facing the country. I believe in problem solving. I'm a can't do, as I said earlier. It's important to solve the problems. That's our responsibility as public officials. That was what mine was. And I no longer would be part of the problem, I'd be part of the solution. And so my book uh, you know, explains how things worked in the past so that people understand, yes, it can work. You know, it's, it's tough business. I mean, you, gotta, you have patience, you have to have perseverance. It's difficult work, but you can do it. And it has been done on many, many instances and in major moments in America. All our landmark initiatives in our history were done, and they wrestled through it, and it worked because it was done on a bipartisan basis and bringing both sides together to what we can do as a people to change it and not sit on the sidelines, but we have to be engaged publicly and to speak up and to influence this process and to change it and demand change from those who are serving in public office and those who are running for public office and be relentless in that communication. I'm curious, uh, do you ever hear from people in other countries who often worry about what they see as you know, insufficient U.S. leadership as a direct result of the congressional situation? Yes, I've talked to people. You know, I have met people on my travels uh, from other countries who have you know, expressed that. You know, surprised you know, why there's so much uh, bickering and can't solve problems. You know, I was in a car the other day and I had a gentleman who you know, had to a program and talking about the divisiveness and why is it so hostile, the conversation all the time, you know, why can't it be more civil? Why is there so much name calling? Uh, and always excoriating and denigrating the other side rather than just talking about the issues that you believe in. Uh, and that's true. I mean, you know, it's also a lack of civility, both in language and tone and the inability of working with one another. And that doesn't exemplify us as a country. Now, they'll, you know, talk about, well, there were worse instances in the past. Well, you would hope by now we would demonstrate some political maturity. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's not the point. The point is that we should do better. At least in the past, we ultimately made decisions. And now we're not making the decisions uh, that we should at a consequential moment in, in, in the life of the country. Great. Well, thank you for joining us today, Senator Snow. Thank you, John. It's great to be here. And thank you. For Global Perspectives, I'm John Bercia, and we'll see you next time.